in our work in, in school administration, whether it's at the district or the school level, is our role to create obstacles and add more work or to create opportunities and take things off of the plate of our, our staff to actually open pathways for our staff so they can do incredible things for our kids. Uh, obviously, I have very strong convictions about what that answer is, but here's a, an interview with an amazing administrator who was once uh, at the school level, was an incredible teacher who's really doing great things to kind of open doorways for teachers using technology to actually open doors and really think about how do we do what's best for kids by ensuring we do what's best for adults and, and opening those doors. In this conversation with Amber Team, and I just finished it, and it, it was really awesome to sit down with her because not only do I revere her as a, a administrator, a mentor, a colleague, but she's also a very good friend. And we also, we talk a lot about the work that she does in education, but we also talk about, you know, sometimes when we kind of hold grudges or we let our ego get in the way and how it actually sometimes hurts our relationships. And I share in a very personal story about how Amber um, actually um, showed me something really about her character when she reached out to me in a time when I was struggling. So uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and I, I, I hope you enjoy the, the conversation I had with Amber. She's absolutely incredible. Here's the, here's the next episode of the Innovators Mindset podcast. Hey everyone, I got a really special guest today. I have a very good friend of mine who is also some, someone that I have uh, mentored me, has given me amazing advice throughout my career and hopefully I've uh, done the same throughout someone I really look up to. And uh, also, I am honorary uncle to her children, <laughs> right? And uh, best friend to her husband, who I met once. And we are very tight. In fact, we are all closer now than Amber and I. But um, a Amber team and Amber team and I met uh, probably, I don't know, 11, 12 years ago, we met virtually through Twitter, and then had probably talked for years and years and years. And then we met in person. And that was probably the greatest experience for Amber, which it wasn't she got mad at oh, me the first day. I, I don't even get it. I don't want to get into it. But we are like, super tight friends. And, uh, and she is an incredible teacher. I actually just found out she won teacher of the year right away, right at the beginning of her career. I didn't even know this. I thought we were good friends. So she has a claim as a teacher. I met her when she's an assistant principal. I watched her in the principal role. And I think one of the things that I loved about Amber was her vulnerability when talking to me is that I saw her go from a place where, to be honest with you, I, I don't think you were struggling in the role, but you were kind of maybe struggling with yourself in the role at the time. I don't know if that makes any sense. And now she works at central office. And so um, if you don't follow Amber, her blog is one of my favorites to read. She doesn't do it enough. Wait, she should do it more, but whatever, because we love hearing from Amber. Uh, you can connect with her on Twitter at 8Amber8. Just so excited to have Amber here. And uh, Amber, if you could just tell everyone a little bit about you, your career, kind of what you're doing now, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, like George said, I, I started out as a fourth grade teacher and got my master's degree in curriculum and instruction. And so worked at a magnet school for a little bit and loved that. I briefly touched base in a technology department in a previous school district and did not love that. Um, and I think it's partly because I knew I had other things that I wanted to try and do. So I became an assistant principal, um, loved that, loved that job. It was all the crazy fun techie things that I wanted to do, but I had a contained staff that I could help and be there for. Um, and then had the incredible privilege of being the principal at Wood Elementary for the past five years. Uh, easily my favorite job to date. Um, I love my people. I love my wolves and lived and embraced that hard for five years and a few months. Um, and then this year in the middle of the pandemic, I uh, had an opportunity to work with someone I'd worked with previously as a director of technology and innovation. And so just like George trying to follow in George's footsteps, <laughs> decided to make that director of technology and, uh, and, and figuring that out these days. Falling in George's footsteps. <laughs> Whatever. So 
we've had like a ton of great conversations over the years. Sometimes you won't talk to me for a couple of weeks after them, but because <laughs> I am kind of your brother a little bit. Kind You're... of mean and slightly a bully at times. But loving, <laughs> but, but always from a good place, right? And you can't ever say that. I, I will say that you always, always from a good place. I just, I just place. say things straight, right? The, I actually, so it's con, like, what's kind of confusing for me right now when I'm listening to you is when I met you, were you assistant principal or were you the doing the, was, did I meet you after the tech stuff? It was after, like, right after the tail end of the tech stuff, because one of our first connections was me writing for your connecting principles blog. Right. And that's why you thought it was so funny because I kept forgetting my password and you're like, hello, technology <laughs> person turned administrator. Yeah. Get it together. And that's I'm what made you an admin is that you started becoming bad with technology right away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember I my password. You probably have emails where you're like, okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to actually ask you about this because, uh, I've been having a lot of conversations about this lately. I actually just had a conversation with someone who is a teacher and they're, they're doing some technology stuff. And is, so when you were doing, cause I think a lot, so correct me if I'm wrong here, when you were doing the tech stuff, when you were in like that tech role, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm assuming and tell me and correct me if I'm wrong, as I said, that when you went to the assistant principal, you probably were doing some of the same tech stuff, but in a, a different position. And to be honest with you, a position of authority. Do you actually think you were able to accomplish some more things just because of your position, like the, like, cause we always talk about distributed leadership and I know that's really important and stuff like that. But I also know that if you are my boss, I, 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 I'm more likely to do things that I know you feel are important. Like, did you find there was any impact there when you like switch positions that people were, maybe there's more buy-in simply because of the title or no? necessarily that it was because of the title. I, I honestly think it's because of the level of support I was able to provide. Mm -hmm. And when I was a technology facilitator, I had 17 campuses. And so if you think K5, 17 campuses, one person, I might could see you once a month, we could communicate via email, I could obviously pop over if you needed me. But in my building, I was there and I got to sell it. Mm -hmm. And I got to support it. And I got to follow up with it. And I got to do I got to model it. I, I just had more opportunities to connect with people versus a drive by like spray and pray that these technology things that I was teaching. Where do you get all these little like sayings from? <laughs> do you have like, do you have a list <laughs> in front of you? You did this to me the last time we talked too. Yeah. I'm like, where are these coming from? You gave me, okay. so these are the same, what'd you say? Paral uh, paralysis, paralysis. And paralysis analysis is like getting too much into to the, uh -huh. like evaluating stuff too much. You don't do anything. Uh -huh. The other one was what the person the position precedes the person. position. And then what was this one? <laughs> you need like just a, you just need a book of amberisms. Amberisms. <laughs> um, sorry. Spray and spray. Like you, I would blow through their building and show them something really cool and fun after school on a Tuesday for an hour. And then good luck with that. And let me know if it works. And if it doesn't call me because who's got time to wait for me to figure out where I am and get back over there to you. And so, I mean, not that we didn't have the best of intentions or right. have incredible supporting resources, but that was really one of the hardest things is that I couldn't sell it to you. I couldn't show you the value of it. I couldn't show you the benefit of it. I couldn't support you as you tried it, let you fail and let you see that that was okay. And then pick you back up and keep on moving the way that I could in my assistant principal role. And I really, I really think that being able to model that this mm. wasn't something that was just something superfluous and fun on top of a, a great teaching. No, I had high expectations for academics too. And, and you and right. I talked a lot about this. Um, never were my expectations for academics lower based on my um, showing you of a blog or of Twitter right. or of connections or of collaboration. This was in addition to high academic e expectations, which again were, were tantamount to my success at Wood Elementary was because that was my floor and never ever my ceiling. Right. And, and when I left, we were the number one elementary school with the highest achievement data, but we also were the most fun and did the most crazy fun stuff. <laughs> and my teachers presented at conferences and what was it like 22 out of 27 of my teachers were promoted in my five years that left me. And that's because of being able to support and allow to grow and to push on 
versus like giving you a handout and telling you it's super great and then moving on. It's amazing how much stuff you've achieved that you've never said to me ever. Like I didn't know any of this stuff. It's incredible. Like it's a shout out Amber. <laughs> so, like, I guess I've always known you're like amazing. And I maybe it's just assume, but like, you, you like you have literally the credentials and all the like so many accolades to do this. I just I'm just I'm blown away. I'm so impressed. So you've always got so much advice for me, George. You never stop to like. So you basically, know. it's because of me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're saying? I'll take that. 100%. I'll take 100%. that. Okay. So okay, this the you made a really good point. I think it's really important. The we were talking about, and I think. I think it's not maybe necessarily in addition to, but it's like different and better because I think too, I've always had this idea of like the, no matter when you went to school, if you're listening to this podcast and you went to school in the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, the, the aughts, I don't know they they called the zeros, the tens, right? <laughs> the actually str the time allotment of the day is literally almost exactly the same. Right. But the expectation is so much more. So like, we have to make decisions. And one of the things I've been kind of exploring, I'm actually write, writing a blog on this as we kind of like just been thinking about this is like, what are the basics? Like, what are the basics, right? Because the basics when I was a kid are not necessarily the basics now. Like if you looked at 2020, COVID, all this other stuff, uh, like a basic is how do you get on Zoom? Like, how do you actually get to that space? And a lot of people couldn't do that, but they could curse of right, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into, I don't want people like, you know, writing graffiti on my house in cursive because they're mad because I'm not saying cursive writing is bad, but is it as necessary in 2020 as it was maybe in 1975. And like, I remember having this conversation about, um, it's that whole exhortation is that we were actually getting kids to write more than ever because we actually went to blogging because they weren't just writing their initial posts. They were actually commenting to other people. So they were writing different things, but then they're also understanding like, what is the difference when you're writing in a space where you can't see facial expressions, where you see this and actually learning to connect? And someone said, well, but they're not writing. I'm like, sorry, do you mean writing or do you mean writing cursive? Because those, those are different things, right? But our kids were writing more than ever and they were actually excelling in their ability to read and write, but they weren't necessarily doing it the way I was doing it when I was in grade four in a, a cahier d'activité, a little French for you, right? That is pretty good. So, so yeah, but the thing, you know, I think the thing that, that when you look at this and I don't know if you have like a closeness bias to this in the sense that we have seen that even if you had really good people that were very comfortable with technology and you had those people, um, or like the great leaders that came into your school once in a while, and you probably saw this, if the admin didn't support it or didn't have it, it didn't matter how good that person was. And I think that's something that's important to me. Like, I think part of it too, is that you've always been comfortable with technology and it's been something that in the administrative position, you not necessarily put at the forefront, but it was like, Hey, this is part of what we do. But I've also wow. seen administrators like, ah, that's like somebody else's thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, have you seen that? Have you seen like, do you see the impact of that? Well, I think that you've got to recognize that everyone is going to have different strengths and mm -hmm. weaknesses. And if that is a strength of mine, there is definitely a counterbalance somewhere of something that I'm not as strong in. And, and building a strong team was always very important to me. Mm -hmm. And even as an assistant principal or even in this role, I've got to surround myself with people who are smarter than me, but also who are smarter differently than me. And so I don't need somebody in my network manager position that can speak educational technology or importance of pedagogy. I, I got that. I can do that part in this role. I need him to know how to work switches <laughs> and how to connect servers. I need him to do that. And so I don't feel competitive in the sense of, let me tell you how much smarter I am than everybody else around me. I, I definitely have strengths, but I also have to counterbalance with some of those weaknesses. And I think technology is one of those pieces that can be so intimidating to people mm -hmm. because they think it is so hard or requires a whole different way of thinking. And that's not necessarily true. It literally is finding the two or three places that you can plug that in to simplify, amplify, exemplify in your world that, that maybe you weren't using before. Mm -hmm. And if that's not the case, then how can you not feel challenged by putting people who are stronger than you and doing it? When I left WIT, all of the delegated pieces that I have are still running smoothly. 
And it wasn't because it was the Amber team and way of doing things. It was because at Wood Elementary, Andrea Jennings took care of social media imaging and communication. So regardless of the event, regardless of what was going on, Andrea Jennings knew my expectations. She knew what I wanted shared. She knew how we wanted it shared and what the message overall was meant to be shared, which is that we love kids. We love school. We love Wood Elementary. She is still running with that ball. And that was something that I tried to teach people too in that role was that it doesn't have to be you. It can just be your tone and then let somebody else do that piece of it so that then I could do summatives or walkthroughs or whatever other administrative pieces where people tell me, well, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to always be you. It can just be done in a mm-hmm. way that embraces your message and, and the atmosphere that you're trying to create as a leader. Um, but to forego any piece of those technology aspects means that you're not going to do as well or be seen as complete as someone maybe who is embracing that. So the, the, yeah, the, the one thing, like I, I agree with you in the sense that it is important to put those people in places that we, of course we have all different strengths, right? Like um, my assistant principal was very good, like with inclusive education. That's one of the reasons I hired her. Uh, Cause that was something that I was continuously growing on. And she knew I was, she was not very good with technology and you put those, and you can do that at the teacher level too. I remember um, my, the principal that really changed my perspective on education, not just leadership was Kelly Wilkins. And she hired me to kind of lead technology, but they weren't looking for, um, it was really interesting because when they interviewed me, they weren't looking for like a tech person. They were just looking like, who is, who is the best person we can find and what gifts will they bring to our school? So they actually said we were hiring for like a grade five to nine position. They didn't say like math. They didn't say grade six science, grade five to nine because they want to see like, who is the, who is the best person we can find? And then how can we like tailor things to that awesome person? Because when we find really good people, we can Mm -hmm. shift things around to fit them. Right. And I remember she gave me a schedule for what she perceived would be a good way to like implement technology in the school. So she had me like 40 minutes of grade seven, a 40 minutes of grade seven, B 40 minutes of grade eight, a, and I would see them every week. And I said to her, I'm like, look, these are just kind of one-offs. I don't think this is a really good idea. I think it'd be way better if I just had like a week, two weeks, three weeks, and we could do like some deep project stuff. And and I I don't know, like I was so new and I don't know why even like I was like, why would I even say this? Like, how do I have the right? And she said to me, Hey, Hey George, this is why we hired you. She said, you're that person. So let's, let's change the schedule. I was like, really? And that was like, not something I was used to that. Like, Hey, like she deferred that to me. There is something that I've, I've always thought about. And like, I wonder what your thoughts on this. I, I believe that you as a principal, I'm not saying you as a principal, I'm saying principles general, there is this perception that, Hey, we can build a culture around this. And then when I leave the culture will maintain, I kind of agree. And I kind of disagree. And the reason I disagree is that if you get a really crappy admin in after they could totally ruin that culture. Like it could maybe go for a little bit, but it's really important to put like Pete, like be thoughtful of the admin too, because I'm sure that a lot of schools had like a uh, principal that really led that school and they had like everything running and it was just awesome. And the culture was built and then the wrong person can go into that space and totally wreck all that progress. And the opposite, I think, believe could be true where you can have a bad situation. Someone can come in and because like the opposite must be true then too, because then how would we ever get out of a bad culture in school? Right? Like, what do you think? What do you think about that? Cause I like you, you were saying about the culture, but I think it was also important. You were mentioning the person that was leading the culture as, uh, as well. Right. And I, I think that culture and systems are two different things. Mm-hmm. And I think that systems can be put in a place that are going to withstand. I didn't want anything that needed me to be able to function and last. And obviously anytime you change, especially with a personality or I, I talk fast, I walk fast, I do things fast. I just, I'm you got those, say, you got those cool talk. sayings. You got your list of amberisms. Exactly. exactly <laughs> right. Do you know that when I left, one of my teachers gave me a shirt with all the things that I always <laughs> say. And she said, I need your new people to see this because I need them to understand who you are and that we love the way you came across. We loved you because of all these things. And it was just the sweetest thing ever. Yeah. And again, I, I think that culture is going to change. And I've had a number of people that have reached out and said, oh, it's just so different. 
Well, of course it's going to be different because Morgan's not Amber and Amber's not Morgan and that's okay. It's going to always be different anytime you have a leadership change. What is important to me are the things that we held as a value, not because Amber Tiemann said so, but because mm-hmm. the WIT community mm-hmm. and the WIT environment, my kids, my teachers, my, my parents, my school district, the things that we held up as a value, those are the things that we will continually still work towards, being inclusive being open and welcoming to different cultures and diversity, just some of those fundamental things. But does Morgan dance on the curb every morning? Probably not. That's okay. <laughs> does she do the jokes on Friday the way that I did right. where I would snort laugh and cry? Probably not. Can you, dro- okay. can you drop one of those jokes? I want to hear one of those jokes. You got them? I'll tell you. <laughs> well, obviously they're school appropriate. Obviously, yes. What was my favorite one? My favorite one was the one, why did the cracker have to see the doctor? And I didn't read it before. This was from Donnie Weist. I'll never forget. <laughs> Shout out to Dewan Weist, who is a big fan of yours. Yeah. Her son turned it in and I didn't read it beforehand. And it's why did the cracker have to see the doctor? And it was because he felt so crummy. <laughs> <laughs> I I just need these for I Kalia. Thought- I need these jokes for Kalia. She, she, this is like, she loves this. Oh my gosh. I will have her call me again. We'll talk about it. <laughs> Kalia likes to call me. She does like to call you. Um, But I I like cried laughing because I thought it was so hilarious. And I didn't, um, again, I'm on Facebook Live because that's how we did our announcements. Um, I guarantee you that Morgan Power reads those jokes before ahead of time. She is ready to go and has has her picked out all things because we're different people. So I don't think that culture necessarily, good can be different and it can be a different version of good. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be the same. But I think that systems that I put into place uh, in other words, what did we, how did we think about these results? How did we measure this against what was most important? What were some of the things that we were striving for? Some of those kinds of pieces, I hope outlast me right. because it was never a Amber said, do it this way. It was that, well, what's best for kids? Well, what did our community tell us about that? How did it make them feel when we accomplished this? Those kinds of questions right. so that it wasn't Amber driven, but it was good practice driven or value driven. Um, wily way driven. It was just a lot of what we were able to to use to move ourselves forward. And it just so happened that we did it really, really well. How did you like, one of the things I really appreciate it and I've seen in your work that is really powerful is how you brought, like, you, you really embody the sense of community in the sense that like this, like, you're not, I'm not, you, it's not just your students or your teachers. It's how you brought your parents in. Like, what did, like, what were some of the things that you did that really, you know, brought that together? Well, again, I, I don't think I could do any of it by myself. I had to have my community with me and yeah. I had to, to play a role in their lives if I wanted them to play a role in our lives and connecting over what was the most important thing to them, which was the most important thing to me, which was the kids that made it easy to do. Um, I had open parent workshops where parents could come in once a month and we, um, what do we call them? Five years ago, I don't remember. Years ago. Um, but it was um, where parents knew they could come in and they could talk to me about anything. And and I needed them to see me as a wife, as a mom, as an administrator, right. as a parent of a kid at that school. Um, and so again, I was all in for all five and a half years that I was there. I went to every event that I was invited to. I went to every church program that they wanted me to be at. I mean, I was more than just the person in the office. I had a chandelier, which I brought with me. It's over there um, <laughs> in my office. And every single parent that walked in said, whoa, it's got my butt in here. I was like, yeah, exactly. Cause that's who I am. And mm-hmm. if they friended me on Facebook, I friended them back on Facebook. Like I did not create a line between Amber Tiemann, the human and Amber Tiemann, right. the principal. Right. I was just accessible in Amber. And I, I mean, I just told you there wasn't a Thanksgiving that I was a principal that I did not have to go back up to my school to get something for somebody right. because I was kind of, I don't say they're back in call, but I was accessible and I was trying to meet their needs in every capacity, whether that was educationally or I had so many moments break down and say, how do I know if my kid's ADHD? How do I know if my kid has a learning disability? What do I do if this test result comes back this? Right. I wanted to be that person for them. I wanted to partner with them. Because at any given moment, I was going to need them to partner with me. And, and I think the, like, but you also, because I think it's important to note that you would do things for your community, but you also had like lines too, right? Like, it's not like you took your summers and just hung out for th- your parents, right? Like, I know no. based on no, your family. I, 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 I mean, we didn't like 
go bar hopping. So you were, we weren't friends. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, like you had like you had boundaries. Like you know, this is my family time. I could shut off my email. Like I, I to be honest with you, I sent you the calendar invite for this like four times. And I'm like, why are you not answering this? You're like, ah, oh, when I get to work. And you were good about that. And I think that's a good thing to do. Like, I'm not actually well, complaining about it because I a little too connected to my phone. I actually turn off know, all my notifications. I, I think I unhealthily, I, I don't know that I did very well with boundaries because that's the way that I wanted to lead. I right. wanted to lead that way. I wanted to lead in a manner that meant I was connected and, and accessible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, date nights I turn my phone off or I would mm -hmm. be on vacation and take the email off my phone, that kind of thing in my defense, we are moving. And so we are in this transitional space right. right now. And so I'm not I have complaining. not had access to the computer while we were over Christmas break. And so I guess it just wasn't showing up on my phone. Oh. But when I got here to work, it was on You're my ignoring phone. me. You're ignoring me. Okay, so I, I, and this might be, I don't know if this is personal, but I think it's important. I remember when you first became a principal, mm -hmm. you were not having a good time. Like you were, it was stressful. Well, I was the first First year principal in the history of the world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, and then like, I, I'll be honest with you. Like I heard from you a lot more, <laughs> the, right? Cause you were like, I need help with this, 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 and this. And then like at the end of your tenure there, like you barely talk and you were just like, good. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, I would want to say that I was worried about you, but I actually wasn't. Cause I was like, she'll be fine. I just, cause I know you. Right. And I know part of it too, is you can tell like people listening to this, you have an extremely high expectation for yourself, right? It's not like you probably were doing uh, very well, but maybe not very well based on what your standard was at the, for yourself at that time. Right. In some respect. So how did you go? And I think this is an important part is that people would look at you right now and see success. But it's not like it was just like, hey, you just woke up one day and we're an awesome principal. So like what what was the progression to that point where you're like, hey, I, I'm good now. Like I, I feel this. Like not that you were like perfect and every day was like you made the right decision 100% of the time. But that point where you were like, I, I, I kind of felt like you were like, I don't know if I want to do this. And then you're like, no, I'm, I'm good. I got this. Right? Like right. how did you progress to that point? Because I think a lot of people don't see those journeys. Well, I did. And I, I luckily, again, have, have always had a really great relationship with you. And, mm -hmm. and what you told me was make sure that you reflect on this, make sure that you are. And in fact, if you go to my blog at amberteeman.com and check out that hashtag the first year, I remember that I blog. Yeah, uh, uh, that's from you. I did that the entire first year that I was principal. And honestly, you can you can group it that first six months where I thought everything was great because again, my outfits are super cute. My jokes are super funny. Um, and then the next six months, because I had started kind of in December, kind of getting a feeling that maybe something wasn't as great as I thought it was. And and it, it came down to relationships mm -hmm. and, and people not being open with me and me not being able to, I guess, be receptive to them. And, and just assuming that when they said, yes, I never dug deeper. Or when they said, that sounds great and smiled awkwardly and walked away. I thought everything was fine. Um, it was that second semester we did our culture survey in the, the February of my first year, 71% of my teachers said that we wanted to work somewhere else. Oh, now Todd Whitaker also pointed out because luckily I had him to, to yeah. have these conversations with too. He said, Amber, they could want to be an administrator. They could want to be a stay at home mom. That's a terrible question. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> own that. All 31% of those people hate you. Right. Calm down. Um, and so what I did, I, I went to my very best friend and I gave her the results of that survey and all of the things that people had written about me, which to this day, I could wrote, tell you what they were because they were so terrible and hurtful. Right. Um, and I had her group them into things that I could accomplish. Um, one of them, an easy one was that I was always on my phone. And if you didn't know me and, and you right. know me, so I, I always have my phone cause right. I'm always available. I've got a fireman and I've got a teenager. Like I, I have always right. got my phone on me. Um, but you're also yeah, like reflecting that. on your phone too, like probably writing notes, you know, sharing oh, stuff too. responding to parents, responding yeah. to my superintendent, yeah. all the things, right? Like I was also 100% accessible for them. Um, so I got an Apple Watch. And so that way I could go, oh, Dr. Vincent, I'll take that in a second. Oh, wait, that's the fire station. Right. Let me step out of this meeting. Those kinds of things. Um, so I was really able to dial down to what perceptions my staff had of me and what I wasn't being for them. Because I had zero desire to be 
the very best principal for Amber Teeman. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the very best principal for Wood Elementary. And that included all 70 of those teachers, all 680 of those kids, all 1,300 of those parents. And while being a principal is the hardest job in the world because you can't ever gauge when you're being successful, because at any given moment, one of those components is not 100% happy with you, right? right. Between students and parents and staff and, and superintendent office or whatever. Mm. Um, it, it really dialed down to me having to slow down. And I had eight PLCs and I cried eight different meetings and I apologized. I read those comments to them and I said, I will be more present. I will... I will work harder for you. I will listen to what you had to say about me and I will do better. And some of it you could let go mm -hmm. of because it was hurtful and hateful. Right. And some of it was productive and I could use it to make myself better. But that's what it was, is that I listened to that criticism and I sat in it. And then I decided to move on, that I had to use it to make me better and that I couldn't stay. A, I always said, I want to be a principal three to five years. That's all I got. By three to five years, I'll know if I'm really good or really terrible. Right. So I had... To figure it out and obviously I also never suck at anything so I could not be good <laughs> like I had to I had to figure that out right like right. I had to work really hard George right. to be to be seen as successful but also to feel like I was doing good in that role right. Right. I wanted kids to be better because I had been in their lives I wanted teachers to to feel as if they had accomplished something because I got to tell them that mm -hmm. those kinds of things I never wanted to just be like what was her name how long was she here like that's not who I wanted to be well, personally, as a friend, I was proud of you when you were struggling and you were working through it. And I was like, just blown away. Um, just all the work that you do. I was very proud of you. And I, I think, I think I, I don't even know if you care if I said that, but. Of course I do. And but, again, you were one of the people who encouraged yeah. me not to. And that's what I said. Like, maybe I, maybe this isn't, maybe this is yeah. wrong. Maybe this is not where I mean to be. Yeah. This is not what I want to well, do. And, and I, wrong. if you remember, I encourage you. I'm like, you got to move from being assistant principal. Like you're ready. Yes. Right. You're done. You're done with this. Yeah. It's ready time to move so, on. So you went to, so now you are in a brand new role and you, and it's interesting to me because um, I actually think the way, what, sorry, and what's the school district you're with right now? Crandall ISD. Crandall ISD. Shout out Crandall ISD. <laughs> Gotta throw a couple of those in. So Crandall ISD, I love, so uh, superintendent is who? Who's your superintendent? Dr. Eldridge. Dr. Eldridge. Okay. So the vision behind your position is something I really appreciate. So, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you are, you are kind of the head of, and I I don't know if I say like, kind of, you are the basically running the IT department, but I, from what I know of you, right? Remember you couldn't do your password. So like you have, you have like good tech knowledge, but I would not, and maybe I'm wrong. I would not say like, hey, go into that like network room and like unplug everything and then plug it back into the right space. Like you're that's not you. No, in fact, today we were discussing getting me access to the Active Directory and all the things. And I said, maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have it. Right, so, right, right. Like, but, maybe you should not hit OK on that. But I, I, but I think the this is this is like a, a shift in thinking and kudos to your superintendent because a lot of times the people that are in charge of IT totally understand technology, but they don't understand technology for learning. You know, for example, um, everything in a lot of school districts is like super locked down. And I remember I told the story many times. I went to one school district and I was like, I want these teachers on Twitter while I'm presenting. They're like, well, they don't have access to Wi-Fi. I'm like, well, get, can you give them access? Said, yeah. I said, can you give me access? Like I need access to the internet. So they gave me the password. I said, oh, I'm just going to throw the password up on the screen and then they could all have the password to the Wi-Fi, which I'm like, how do they not have it anyway? And they're like, no, 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 you can't put it on the screen because we don't want them knowing it because then they're going to log on after. So I'm not even kidding. The IT department literally went to every single teacher in the room, took their device from them, put the Wi-Fi password in so the teachers would not know. And so a lot of IT departments, and I'm not, and I say this again, I'm not saying this in a negative way, they have the, probably one of the hardest jobs because nobody ever compliments them. Nobody phones them at the end of the day and says, hey, the internet worked all day, thanks. Like that's not a call they get. It's always like, this doesn't work, this is an issue, that's a problem. But 
they are they're not necessarily trained in the sense of working in schools they're ne- they're sometimes trained of working in a bank and i want my bank stuff closed and private and i don't want anyone to see it whereas you can't take that same thing with education when we're trying to open doors for kids who if their stuff gets seen might open up doors for like perfect uh job opportunities for like college and it's a different sense so how like when you have that position i love that the fact that you have a deep understanding of technology, but you also have people who know the bells and whistles and that's part of it, but it's kind of under your vision of what you want for teaching and learning. Is that correct? Or, and like, how do you see yourself going into that role? Absolutely. So she, um, when, when, when I found out the position was able to apply, the original title was director of networking services, like director of like CIO information services, Mm. information officer. Um, and I don't, I don't know how to do that job. I can't do that. Right. Job. I don't know networks. I don't know switches. I don't really need that kind of business. But what I do know is what it feels like to be a teacher and struggling in the classroom. I know what it feels like to be an administrator and hit hurdle after hurdle after hurdle and feel like I'm talking the language that I talk every day with my people. Right. And yet you have no idea the words that are coming out of my mouth. Right. Right. And so we, the, they renamed this position to director of technology and innovation. And that opens the door for yep. leadership. That opens the door for um, me to work with, obviously, the curriculum department, but also to help these these people in this building, right. in my office, my my team, to figure out how to say yes. And and again, I mentioned a while ago that I, I spent a year and a half in a tech department, and every single day I got told no. And every single day I had to tell teachers, oh, we can't do that, because if everybody's not doing it, then you can't do it. Right. Well, if they can't make it work across the board, then you can't try this. And it was the most exhausting position it was the most depressing place I'd ever been ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've already talked to our team. And again, I've been here just two months now um, that our goal is to try to figure out how to say yes. We might be able to say yes to the entire pie, but we can say yes to a slice. We can say yes to half the pie for now and we'll figure out how to get the whole pie later. Um, but that is my that is my role and goal here is for them to never see us as someone who is shutting them down in the opposition, but instead the people who are opening the doors and providing opportunities and giving them the tools or the resources available to make incredible things happen with their students. And so this, like I actually, as you're talking years ago, I wrote a blog post on five, four guiding questions for your IT department. And it was basically that, cause I would run into like, Hey, we want to do this. Well, this doesn't work with our system. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, so your job is to figure out how to make it work with our system. Like if the system, if it doesn't work within the, the, system we need to change the system right so the questions are what is best for kids how does this improve learning if we're to do x what is the balance of risk versus reward right and like it is important that we analyze like is there risk inherent in some of the stuff that we're doing right and is this serving the fewer the majority and the reason i ask that is this serving the fewer the majority is that we have some kid who writes something super inappropriate online does something and then they shut down social media amongst the, the entire school i'm like okay like where in life is that a good practice where we actually punish the majority of people because somebody did something stupid, right? And I think it actually, as opposed to saying like, how do we teach our our kids to do that? And I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate about, first of all, I know you're gonna be amazing in that role, but it's, I think it's more important that role actually exists. I think that is a huge win for education in the sense that we, like it is I like a lot of people with IT departments see it as like this is a block to doing things not as this is a pathway to doing this right like you know I I went from a district that blocked everything to a district that basically had everything open except for like literally pornography and gambling and I'm not even kidding some of the math teachers like hey we could use gambling for statistics I'm like yeah that might be pushing it a little bit but it was like I, I just remember that was a thing that like it was a totally different thing. But when that when the site when sites were open and that meant we had to actually teach proper use. But when everything's closed, it's like this is not our problem. Like the the, the filter will get it. Like the filter will find, you know, will will save us in the situation. Not teaching our kids and now like remember do you remember the advice of like, hey, put your computer like don't put your computer in a kid's bedroom, put it in the kitchen. And it's like, okay, that advice doesn't apply anymore because they have 18 devices. They go, you know, right. But yeah, have it in your kitchen. Was, you know, that, I wonder if that advice lasted for like four months was good. 
right? Can they make it? Everybody had to have it. So okay, so okay, so your career is stellar. I want to talk to about. I want to talk about something personal, and I think this is a, a really important lesson. So uh, you and I kind of can be brother and sister, and we can get in fights. And one time you were like really peed off at me, like you wouldn't even talk to me. Okay. One time. No, but like, <laughs> like you are never going to talk to me again. Like uh-huh. one time, right? And this is gonna be hard for me to say. And then my dad died. I don't know if you remember this. You were like one of the first people to contact me and you took care of me. And I, the reason I bring this up is because I think it's really important is that sometimes you get in these situations and we know like, you know, we, we have these issues, but I think sometimes we are so stubborn about things that when we see a person in need, um, we will, even if we had a follow, we won't reach out. Like we won't do that. And it's more of a pride thing. And you were, I really like, I actually remember that you didn't just like reach out and like you were connecting with me. Cause you know, like it still affects me obviously, but I just, I just wanted to like, cause I think it's an important lesson for people listening. Cause I think sometimes we would let our ego get in the way. Right. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> Not that you remember that, but. Oh, I remember all of it. I remember why I was so mad at you too. We won't okay. No. Anymore. Whatever. All of your people. Um, no, it was. Do you remember what it was? Do you remember what you said? No. Well, I, like I'm, I, yeah, this is, yeah, I don't. No, and I, I think you're focusing on the wrong part of the story right now. <laughs> no. Every everybody in every relationship says something that pees the the other person off, right? As a person, we're struggling with something so profound it completely outweighed my annoyance right. at, at what you had said right and, and again it was a flippant comment about my hair because that's how <laughs> I, that's better Anderson you can be <laughs> um but i was so annoyed at you and just so like i'm in chicago and the only person i know is this guy and he's being insulting i'm going home <laughs> um and so it was, again, I don't think that you appreciate the, the trajectory impact that you have had in my world. I know a ton of people can say that, but because again, I was invited to your wedding because my husband does adore you. I feel like I can say all that to be true. Yeah. Um, I did not want you to be sad and be by yourself Right. and, and knowing what I knew and, and how very important that relationship was to you. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been friends ever since. Right. And then, and uh, now. We, we laugh, we make jokes about, we make hair jokes all the time. Hmm. We do, wow. right? Cause it's, it's, come on. We are like super close, I'm right? Having a good hair day. He says, but I'm having a better hair day. <laughs> I'm having a pretty good. So I actually, I was having a really good hair day and I just put the headphones on. Cause I was like, ah, I know how, how sensitive she is about her hair. So I just, I don't want to show her up in the sense, oh, he's but whatever. Canada. But no, I think, I think, you know, for me, it is like. It, that that really mattered, and I always i i i think I think about that because I wish that I could just say that I've never, you know, like I've had falling out with people, and I wish I could sometimes get over that stuff. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know, it's something that I I to be honest, with you, I wish I could grow from too, and I have in some ways, but some ways I'm like I I need to like reach out to this person. I need to reach out to this person, right? And sometimes it's our ego, right? And I think go of yeah pride yeah okay all right so on a less serious note um the dallas cowboys <laughs> they they lost so if they would have gotten the playoffs they would have been so whoever got in the playoffs from the nfc east would have been the worst doesn't matter who won would have been the worst matter. team ever to get in the nope. playoffs correct yes um, so what, tell, tell everyone, why are you like so obsessed with the Dallas Cowboys? Cause I know there's an answer to this. Like they were really good. I, I, like I remember when they were they really have, good. Yes. And they are not that far from that right now, George. Thank you very much. Um, the very first picture, one of the first pictures I have of me as a baby is in this big old t-shirt that says, if you ain't for Cowboys, you ain't for blank. Cause I don't. I don't use curse words, but if you ain't for Cowboys, you ain't for blank. Right. Uh, and that is, again, was just, I was a football family. We were a sports family. So I grew yeah. up watching football and sports. My ringtone when I met Michael was the ESPN tone until that confused him. So I had to change it. Um, 
So I, I've always been a huge sports fan. And then I went to the, <laughs> see the Rose Bowl right. um, in 1988. And UCLA was there and oh. one Troy Aikman was playing. And I was just in awe of this quarterback who was just this phenomenal football player in person. You went to that you actually went to the Rose Bowl? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. That was the Cotton Bowl. Uh it was, it was the Rose Bowl. The Cotton Bowl. They were played the play. It was like a Bowl. it was a big it was a big final game big with Troy Aikman. And that next year he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. And we had season tickets on the opposite side the entire time they were at the old stadium. And so we went all the time. So um, obviously the quarterback, leader of the team, there's a lot of similarities there with goals and aspirations and all that kind of stuff. And then watching him, when I was teaching fourth grade, I realized that my fourth graders at the time had never seen him as a football player. They'd mm-hmm. only seen him as an announcer. And that was just like a <laughs> right. whoa moment in life. Um, but I have just always, always been a huge sports fan, but in particular, you love your team. Right. And nobody loves bigger. So, better, so you know? who's, who's, who's the team that you hate because of the Cowboys? Is there a team there? Like, you're like, this team is, I hate so this team. So I, I, the Cowboys should not have made the playoffs. That would have just drug out the suffering even further. So we were just <laughs> right. ready for this page, this chapter to right. close, this season to end. Um, you know, and again, these are, these are our people, but Joe Mazza and Brad Curry right. and all these huge um, Philadelphia Eagles Eagle fans, fans um, Salam, Principal Hill, all those people. And then the Giant fans, you've got Tom Murray, Matt right. Noxious. Right. So as long as neither one of those teams win, <laughs> I'm good. That's right. I'm not a Packers fan. I'm not a Bears fan. Right. But I don't hate them. If they're on, I'll watch them. It's fine. Right. If your Mayfield entertains me, that's fine. Um, as long as it's not the Eagles and not the Giants, because those are just your bitter rivals that are just so, and they're so hateful. <laughs> they hate on us more than we ever could hate on them. And so right. they hate our team more than they love their team. That's right. That's fair. Yeah. Cause like, you know, being Canadian, I love teams, but also I'm Canadian. So I don't actually hate other teams. So I'm like, eh, I kind of like Green Bay too. Like I'm a big Bears fan, but I, Aaron Rodgers is just a swell guy. It's very Canadian. I don't know. So, but that, that's actually, I think, um, the, the reason I, like, I always like talking some of this personal stuff too. And I think that you have, uh, I don't know if you, so I don't know if you have like an actual obsession with the Cowboys or like, it's like a persona that you have an obsession with the Cowboys. I, mean, I don't know which one it is, but I think it's actually, yeah, I think it's actually one of the things that people appreciate. And I think a lot of times. You, you mentioned this before, and I think it was really important. You're like, hey, I'm like a wife, I'm a mom, you know, I have kids in the school. And sometimes when we go into these roles, like I always tell people like in your profiles, if you're, if you put like principal, like I won this award and stuff like that, it's way easier to criticize you. But if I, if I put dad, it's like, oh, he's a dad. Like I'm going to go blast this, pr- oh, he's a dad. Right. And it just, it, I think that's part of it too, is that we have to remember that um, you know, as parents that these people that are taking care of our kids are uh, oftentimes parents or it's like sports fans or people we you know, connect with. And I think that a lot of times we lose that sight. And I think it's important. Like I've always been, and you know, this about me, like I've been a huge advocate that you shouldn't have a professional and personal account. They should just merge because I think it not only is a good um, way for people to connect and know who you are, but it's also good modeling to our students that, I always say, like, if you can't say it to kids in a classroom, you shouldn't say it online. And I know that's something that is for you. But I also see you, I, I also see you, com- like, fighting with people about football games, which I guarantee you, if a kid talks back to you in school about the Cowboys, you'd probably talk back, right? You would give it a hard there time. There are relationships that are in my world that only exist based on the fact that I love the Cowboys. There are parents who... <laughs> tagged me in right. their Christmas picture of their kids in their LSU jerseys, right. um, just giving me a hard time. So absolutely. And, right. and again, it is such a part of my world. I have one of my favorite pictures ever is of me in a cowboy jersey and little Drew in his Saints jersey. And I'm doing like this and he's giving a big thumbs up. And I right. love that kid. And it's just, I mean, that is, it's a huge part of who I am, but also you have to know that you're not going to agree with everybody about everything. Right. If I can model what a, a discourse might look like, even if it's over something as trivial as a football game, um, then that's an opportunity for me to be able to be true and to show them that you don't have to agree with everybody about everything. It's going to be okay. Okay. So, okay so the takeaway here, cowboy jokes, fine. Hair jokes, not okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> right? So cowboy jokes? Good. Hair jokes? <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's good. And that's the takeaway, everybody. <laughs> Aaron Zamber, I know that uh, I, I took uh, some of your time today and we were having a great conversation before and uh, I love kind of throwing off ideas for you. I, I want to just share, uh, if you anyone listening, connect with Amber, watch her stuff, read her blog, follow her on Twitter, especially if you do not like the Cowboys because that's totally fair game. And uh, you'll see great leadership. And I've just been, I, I've been, I'm grateful to have such a long friendship with you but also to, I've actually seen your trajectory change uh, over time. And like, I always knew, well, obviously you won teacher of the year right away. So like, we knew you're going to be great, but I've also, I've been great. I've been witness to see the struggles and to see your progression. I think that's such a valuable story to so many, right? Cause a lot of people are struggling right now. And when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see a way out. And I think that you're the embodiment of that. And I appreciate your vulnerability to share that not only today, but you know, actually when it was happening. So um, make sure you give Amber a follow. And Amber, thanks for listening. Any last words to the audience? No. <laughs> Nothing? That's it? I'm good. All right. We've literally been talking for two hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for making you. I'm sorry for our, for our friendship. Whatever. All right. Okay. So, and then I will just play. Uh <laughs> I was going to play something, but uh, yeah, you know what? Da bears. Da bears. bears. (laughs) That's my team. All right. Thanks, everyone. Listen. Have a wonderful day.